All right, good afternoon and good morning from wherever you may be uh, watching our webinars. Uh, thank you again for attending. Uh, we have a really great presentation today from Dylan Bailey from uh, Dylan Bailey's Yacht Survey. Did I get that right, Dylan? Yes. Yeah, Yacht Survey, got it. Um, so it's going to be our rigging inspection. I think everyone's going to really enjoy it uh, as we continue to do these uh, as time goes on. A couple uh, housekeeping items we'll go through before I turn it over to Dylan. A uh, couple updates on our end. This week is going to be, or the next week, the 27th, is the last chance to up, uh, purchase the Supplement 60 pre-order. So if you want to get the new standard book, uh, it's the last chance to pre-order it. Some really good stuff is republished. Uh, we have a new lithium-ion technical information report that's in there. So keep a lookout for that. Uh, we have a newsletter going out this afternoon, which is going to cover a whole gamut of things, including a, a nice video from uh, John, our president. So look out for that one. Um, our weekly webinars. Uh, we are going to uh, go monthly for the next two months to keep uh, that everyone seems to be working a little more, and we want to make sure we're providing a good resource here still. So uh, as people are still working, I am up in New Jersey and still haven't got a haircut, as I'm sure you can tell. Um, so it's uh, we know some other places are open a little more. So uh, we have our first one, uh, first monthly one in July and then August, and then we'll be uh, picking up a pretty full schedule for the fall. So keep a lookout for uh, updating of the uh, those slides. Uh, CEUs. Uh, we will continue to give CEUs for these. A little bit of a change from the last week is uh, we won't be sending out the follow-up email till Monday. So if you're watching this live, uh, Monday afternoon, you'll get an email with a link to apply for those CEUs. The same process you've done before, uh, just follow that. And as always, any questions that come up during the presentation, uh, just type them in the box, and as time allows, I'll be reading them off to Dylan to answer for you. Uh, online resources, uh, continue to have our resources for instructors. Um, one big thing I know I announced the last webinar is our uh, workbook that matches our textbook. Um, it's a really great resource, especially if there's going to be remote learning going on in the classroom, uh, to have that workbook to go along. So if anyone's interested in seeing a sample of that, there's an educator that can use it, just uh, let us know. Uh, we still have our self-study for our certifications with our ProctorU online proctoring, so you can do it from home. Um, and we picked up on our releasing of free micro courses on our new learning management system. So if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that, I, I definitely encourage you to. Our interactive online classes. So these have been going really, really great. Um, there's been a few articles written about it, most recently uh, in the publication of Voting Industry that's coming out. Uh, their digital one came out yesterday. Um, if you have any curiosity of what it's like, uh, it's a pretty good article on what we've been doing. So take a look at that. Uh, here's a couple classes we have coming up, but if you go to abyc.org slash schedule, uh, you'll be able to get a full list of our classes that are uh, upcoming. And lastly, we have our next webinar. Mark your calendar for July 23rd. Our lead instructor, Mike Boniker, will be taking us through uh, some propane systems. So definitely mark your calendar. It's going to be another good one. Uh, and, you know, as we continue to do these, we make sure there's always something for everyone. So I uh, hope you're enjoying them. Any topics, let us know. Um, with that, I'm going to drop my crazy hair off camera and turn it over to Dylan. Okay, good morning or afternoon, wherever you're attending, everyone. And uh, thank you for attending. And, and David, thank you for everything that you guys are doing at ABYC. I uh, greatly appreciate it. I think it's a, you know, really great for everyone in the industry, from boat builders, repairers, uh, marine surveyors. A um, little bit about me. I, son of a boat builder, my father built uh, his first sailboat shortly after I was born um, near Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, he eventually had a boat yard in Norfolk, Virginia. His name's Howdy Bailey. Uh, go way back with ABYC and using their standards. And on the screen, you'll see a couple of the boats we built. Um, this is where my interest in sailing and, and rigging came from and, and watching the rigs get assembled on our boats. And then in the mid 90s, I started becoming interested in rig inspections and rig failures and why stainless steel fails, considering at that time we thought this stuff could last forever and was much better than bronze. And I think we've learned uh, that's not necessarily the case. I will also tell you that there's a lot of slides in this presentation. So if you think I'm going a little bit too fast, this will be on the YouTube channel that you can go back to. But I wanted to have a lot of visual references for us to, uh, to spot these failures. Goal of my presentation is to educate everyone in the marine industry who's working around not just sailboats, but power boats with lifeline, stabilizer mast, um, Davit style mast uh, for putting a dinghy on a hard top, Katie Krogan, uh, Sabres, uh, 
lots of exit expedition yachts out there have at least some sort of mast aboard and we shouldn't be ignoring this rigging either uh, and i've seen too many failures of lifelines um, as short as seven years on on the vinyl coated lifelines so this is all stuff we need to pay attention to no matter what the boat is and sailboats are aging and people are not changing out the rigging as they should and they're sometimes changing the rigging and not changing the chain plates um, that's not a good recipe so i will keep this fairly simple um, we're mainly going to concentrate on aluminum mast and stainless steel wire rigging so that is the majority of what's out there and for what our time allows but i'll touch on a few different more advanced techniques if anyone wants to uh, learn more about those uh, please contact me my contact information will be at the last slide so i thought i'd start giving some seminars to sam's members because i was a little disturbed after inspecting a few boats that had recently been surveyed by surveyors um, i'm not necessarily going to say what organization they're part of but i see this happening with marine surveyors. I also see it with some professional riggers. There's a lot of great marine surveyors out there. There's a lot of great riggers out there, um, but some things are being missed. And this is some of what I see. That's the obvious things that have been missed. We have a swedge fitting with crevice corrosion, a heavy service rust. Um, the lines going up and down are, are basically cracks from the crevice corrosion. The upper right hand side of the screen is a chain plate on a Heinz Christian that had severely cracked chain plates. Uh, the rust is usually the giveaway. When you see the rust, go a little bit closer and take a better look and you will, you will usually find a crack or heavy pitting. I'm not going to cover wood and mass, but I wanted to put this in here. That water intrusion causing rot in wood mass is a big deal. Down in the southeast where I do most of my work, I don't see wood mass very often, but uh, I've seen plenty of um, rot like this on the Chesapeake Bay and further north. A couple of resources, and lots of good articles in Professional Boat Builder over the years. Um, I wrote one on Chain Place a few years ago. Professional Boat Builders archives are available online. That's a huge resource. Uh, it's not on here, but I was just thinking, talking to David earlier, taking the corrosion certification with ABYC gives you certain knowledge to uh, the corrosion that can be helpful in doing these rig inspections. So articles on Boat US website, some of them I've written. Uh, there's a lot of great articles there um, covering more geared towards the boat owner, but can also be very helpful to us in the marine industry. I'm not sure if you can still find this online, but Navtech uh, had a great rigging service guide that was uh, available on their website, and they're no more. Um, they've been, I guess, taken over by Hank. Uh, if you can find that information, um, it's helpful, or maybe email me and I can send you a copy. And the most important thing that you can download, free document, very helpful, is the United States Coast Guard NAVIC 02-16. It's just full of information, a lot of knowledgeable riggers, um, rigging manufacturers, and people in the industry contributed to this. A lot of hard work was put into it, and I'm happy that we have this resource. This has been the big question for probably the past 30 years that I can think of is with sailboat owners um, and some people in the industry is, well, how long does stainless steel rigging, how long does aluminum mast um, last? These are some guidelines from NAVTEC um, publication. These are very conservative numbers in my opinion, and there's a lot of variables that go into how long the rig is going to, to last. Um, my take of it is basically this. It comes down to, just as stated um, at NAVTEC, uh, as far as the environment and salt in the air, humidity, there's a lot of different factors that'll affect the rig. Uh, the one thing I've seen, no matter where in the country, is catamarans that are sailed on a regular basis, especially when we have these charter catamarans sailing daily. I'm seeing failures within five years of the rigging being installed. So you, I'm, you know, if it's a charter boat, I think it needs to be inspected yearly. And if it's a cruising boat, look at maybe up to five years. And if it's, uh, you know, weekend boat, that's, you know, a different story. So every boat's gonna be different. It's all gonna depend on their history and where they've been located over the years. The toolkit is, it, 
is really simple. Um, there's not a whole lot of money that needs to be spent to do inspections like this. I'm not going to cover much on the aloft inspections. Um, I think that those are best left to professional riggers that have proper climbing harnesses and know the, safe, know the safety procedures they need to follow to do those safely. So what we're talking about is mostly what can be done at deck level by pretty much any of us in the industry. Uh, I use a red scotch Sprite pad, a nylon pad, a couple good magnifying glasses, and one of the most important things you can have is a good camera that has a macro setting or a um, mirrorless camera or DSLR that has a, a macro lens attachment. When you spot deficiencies in these fittings, you want to take photos of them and then look at them on your computer screen or blow them up on an iPad to get a better look. There's times when I know there's a problem with the fitting and I just cannot get a good enough look at it and I can find that defect when I go back to uh, to the photos at a later date. A little bit more advanced but it doesn't cost a lot of money and doesn't take up a much room in the tool bag is, is a dye penetrant kit and dye penetrant in my opinion has to be used on rod rigging. Uh, the rod rigging needs to be disassembled Dye penetrant testing, it's really the only way you're going to find the stress cracks on the on the ball. It's also helpful for chain plates and then swedge fittings. What we're looking for is rust staining. Rust of any kind, rust staining on stainless steel. That's a giveaway that there could be an issue there. Stress and fatigue cracks are normally in how I see this corrosion start. And their hairline cracks are very difficult to find until they start rusting. When the rust stains are very heavy, it's usually too late. That's when the crevice corrosion is becoming bad inside of that crack. Broken strands, I see this because the geometry of the rig is incorrect and there's a hard spot. See it quite often aloft on catamarans. Uh, I've seen it in catamarans. I've only been uh, there about seven years old and found broken strands aloft. Elongated deformed holes when you have a stainless pin inserted into another piece of stainless steel or an aluminum tang on the mast. The holes can be deformed, the fasteners can be deformed. Crevice corrosion, and we'll have plenty of photos of, of examples of that. Paint cracks and blisters on aluminum, and not just aluminum mast, but carbon fiber mast. And then going back to the geometry of the rig and also ensuring that the rig is properly tuned. Checking the tune of the rig might be a little bit over the ability of, of someone who say is not a rigger, um, but you're looking for obvious slackness or, or might, what might feel like a stay or shroud that's been over tightened. For the inspection, I, this is the way I do it and um, kind of have a process I try to follow each time. Um, ideally, I like the mast down off the boat. Um, I, I don't like hikes, which is kind of ironic that I, I have this passion for rigging and rigging failures and corrosion, and I absolutely hate going up a mast. Um, but when I approach a boat, I want to take, or the mast, if it's on saw horses or stands, I like to take a look at the overall rig. And then I'll inspect the deck fittings and wire if the mast is up. And I think it's key to start at the deck because no one wants to risk going up a mast if we have a crack swedge, missing card or pin, or any number of deficiencies that could be at deck level. We want to catch that ahead of time. I also want to look at those lifelines when I'm getting on the boat, because if the lifelines are in very poor condition, then there's a good chance that the standing rigging is in poor condition as well. And I, I can't stress enough, do not go up a rig if you do not think it's safe, as we don't want to play with anyone's lives. Pay close attention to the chain place at deck level. And inspect all attachments at the mast, boom, and everything that's at eye level. You want to take a close look at, you want to photograph this and look at it later that evening or the next morning. And you want to inspect the running rigging for wear, especially if you're using a halyard to go up the mast. Blocks, attachments, everything should be functioning correctly. Um, the spin lock type um, rope clutches should, should not slip when you pull on the line when they're closed. Look at the deck step, 
look at the base of the mass on deck or keel if it's a keel step mass. Inspect the chain plates closely from down below. Sometimes they're hidden by interior woodwork, but check that if the varnish or the coating on that woodwork, is it discolored? If it is, then water's been leaking from that chain plate and you need to remove that part of the interior to gain access to this. If you're comfortable with everything that you've inspected at deck level um, and you're comfortable going up the rig, then that would be the time to then go up the rig. So like I said, lifelines, first thing to check when going on the boat. Here's a couple of examples of lifeline failures. Swage fittings, vinyl coated lifelines, that's a big one. I also sometimes see it on the fittings themselves. And one thing that I think we, we miss, I know I missed um, early on uh, at my day survey, is not checking the base of the lifeline stanchions. You can see on the top right side of the screen, there's a, a crack on the stanchion base. I'm seeing more and more of this on uh, boats that are over 20, 25 years old. This is a lifeline swedge fitting after it's been cleaned with the scotch Brite pad, and we can make out where the cracks are. So staining rigging and, and chain plates, I, I kind of tied them all in together. Uh, there's been some arguments with some, some riggers and surveyors over the years that I've had in discussions where some riggers believe that the chain plate should be inspected by the marine surveyor and the marine surveyor thinks the chain plate should be inspected by the rigger. Um, I, I think both parties need to inspect both and then leave the loft rigging for the rigger is, is the way I like to handle that. So pretty much all stainless steel is going to have some surface corrosion on it, some rust staining, um, I guess is a better term for it. And it most likely isn't going to be a big deal on, on newer rigging. So I start with something like this, and I want to clean it up and get a good look at it and take a scotch right pad. But often on the older boats, we have rust staining that's worse like this. And you can actually make out these dark rusted lines on this wedge fitting or, um, or stress cracks, and there's crevice corrosion inside that fitting. This is a swedge fitting that looks similar to the previous slide that's been cleaned off with a uh, scotch Brite pad, and now we can make out the cracks a little bit better. This is on a catamaran, 40-some foot catamaran, uh, seven years old or six years old. Uh, the arrow points to a couple um, broken strands where that swedge fitting at the end of the swedge fitting. This boat had been cruising the previous winter and hauled out for the summer. And this was all during a pre-purchase uh, inspection. So it's something that we need to catch before a boat like this heads back offshore. Barber poling, where you have the uh, the rust that that wraps its way around um, wire. A lot of times it's it's not that big of a deal. I see a lot of the more recent wire on newer boats have have this problem. But what I'm showing here is an example of where the wire has actually become, is pitted and rough. Um, so there's some corrosion inside of that wire. I would recommend that piece of wire be replaced. I'd actually recommend replacing all of the wire. Um, I'm a firm believer that if you're gonna replace one piece of rigging, you need to replace it all as far as stainless steel goes. And then it's all done at the same time. And then it can be done again in seven years, five years, 10, whatever the, the next interval will be. Mechanical fittings, uh, I've installed quite a few of these over the years. Um, they're, they're great. And this is only maybe a year and a half to two years old. Um, the problem here is the plastic cover that's on a, a lot of catamarans standing rigging. It covers the wire, it traps the salt in there. There's very little oxygen, crevice corrosion develops, and we're seeing the rust actually running out from underneath the plastic cover onto this uh, mechanical fitting. Turnbuckles, stainless steel turnbuckles, uh, after 10 years, I, I start seeing cracks like this. This is probably more like 20 some years old and it's becoming quite bad. This is a toggle with the teeth fitting. Take a close look at these, especially at deck level. 
and you can see that there's one, two, three cracks in here total, I believe. This is a, an issue that I've come across where I mentioned um, rigging's been replaced, but the chain plates might have been, been forgotten or, or left for some reason. This is a Bristol 47 was in, in really good condition. Uh, the wire rigging was not that old, looked good. Um, chain plates had had their covers pulled and had been resealed. Some of them were showing some rust stains on the deck where they were leaking, but those were done at the same time that the standing rigging had been replaced. Let's take a little bit closer look. Once we get down to where the chain plate is, the arrow points to a rust stain, and inside that rust stain is, is cracks that radiate from the edge of the chain plate inward. And we can see some rust staining there where the caulking is, and there's a crack in the, uh, the cover going from the, uh, the fastener hole underneath the arrow. This is a closer look at that Hans Christian earlier with the cracks. So we have one crack that has a lot of rust sweeping out of it. Rust is weeping out from underneath that toggle. And then up from that a little bit, you can see some stress cracks without as much rust in them. So if we know this looks this bad where it goes through the wood, we can only imagine what it looks like down inside the wood and on the underside of the deck. Another example from a from a '80s era boat with the original chain plates, and we have a crack that's radiating out from that fastener hole. And sometimes we have chain plates that are pulled, polished, and then reinstalled, like we have here. When you're inside the boat and you see the stain that's been applied over water damaged wood, that's a giveaway that it's been leaking. It was highly polished, but it's starting to rust again. And where we see all these little rust blooms are actually stress cracks and crevice corrosion. And I did, for, for years when I would ask surveyors or briggers, um, you know, when should we pull chain plates? When should we replace this? The answer would be, well, you know, pull a chain plate, see if it's corroded. If it is, then replace it, then pull them off. The problem with this is we have pulled chain plates um, and seven of the chain plates have been perfectly fine and one of them's bad and six chain plates have been fine and one's bad. So I'm a firm believer if you're going to pull a chain plate, pull them off, inspect them, you know, ideally replace them if it's of a certain age, but definitely pull them. And just because corrosion isn't visible on the outside of chain plate, it doesn't mean that there's not corrosion on the back side of it where it's bolted to the bulkhead. This is a chain plate that's been pulled off of a bulkhead. You can see multiple stress cracks and heavy rust staining. If you clean the chain plate up, up and remove all the rust, now what you see is better view of the stress cracks and you can see the heavy pitting from crevice corrosion. Some chain plates are connected with down rods like this. This is where uh, the chain plate enters the underside of the deck and then the down rod is attached to a fiberglass thin chain plate at the hull. And that's what that looks like. We quickly touched on embedded and fiberglass thin chain plates. You know, these are nearly impossible to inspect. If the chain plate doesn't have any stress cracks or crevice corrosion above the deck, we cannot tell what it's like where it enters the hull. So this came up with um, a discussion with Beth Leonard at Boat US. I uh, give her credit for coming up with the idea, well, why don't you thermal image the, the hulls and see if you can see the moisture? And this is what we found. So you take your uh, your typical Irwin Island packet. There's multiple Taiwanese boats with fiberglass and chain plates, and it looks perfectly fine from the exterior. Looks perfectly fine from the interior. Thermal image it from the interior, and we can make out a vertical line coming through the deck. That's our chain plate. And for lack of a better word, this blob that's kind of surrounding it and off to the left is trapped moisture. So then you remove that part of the cabin 
and uh, drill a hole and then the water comes out and the owner now knows that there's an issue with that chain plate. All of the chain plates on this one particular boat were bad except for one and that goes back to well what if we had pulled the one chain plate that ended up being good and the boat owner says okay that's enough we're not going to go any further I'm fine I'm going to go off and sail around the world. The chain plate was pulled by uh, my father and his guys at his shop down in Norfolk and cut the chain plate in half. And this is a good example of how much of the chain plate is wasted from crevice corrosion. I'd say that's close to 50% of that chain plate is, is gone. Taiwanese uh, catch imaging the hull from the inside, fiberglass and chain plate. The dark part of the image where it makes the T is uh is rust and there's water around that that's the other difference in the uh, thermal pattern so the person did buy the boat and they cut it out and they sent this photo to me he and his daughter were going to fix this boat up and um, go cruising so I'm, I'm glad we caught this and it was very difficult to tell him to pull these chain plates out without showing him some proof that there was an issue Running rigging is pretty basic. Uh, you know, just check for any chafing, check for, um, like I mentioned, spin lock style uh, clutches and pulleys, um, blocks. Normal wear and tear, you know, is pretty common on, on most running rigging. Make sure when you're standing at the mass, the in column, the spreaders are in line. Check all your attachment points, your gooseneck where the boom attaches, check your cars for the sail, boom vangs. Basically, when we're looking at aluminum mass, we're looking at the similar metals. We're looking at stainless steel fittings and bolts and fasteners, and we're looking at aluminum and we're sticking them in a salt water environment. Um, it's just a real appetite for, for destruction of the aluminum um, and of the stainless steel. Uh, and I've even seen, you know, where if you think about um, carbon fiber mass, your your carbon fiber and stainless steel fasteners, wood mass, we put fasteners in the wood, and when the seal seal wears away, um, we have we have rot. So um, I don't think there's one particular um, material that is uh, that is foolproof. On catamarans, the cross beams need very close um, inspection. Every single attachment point needs to be inspected. I also like to take a good look at the uh, gel coat where the uh, the attachment point is for the cross beam on the hull and just see if there's any stress cracking there. It, can I move it by hand? Um, is it solid? Roller furlers should turn freely, have no binding, not make horrible screeching sounds when you turn them either. The last part of the mass is the Look at the mass step, especially down in the bilge. Uh, you, once again, you have a you just have a recipe here for um, for corrosion. In this case, we have a mass that's been leaking from the mass collar, so you definitely want to check the mass collar and deck penetration where it goes through the mat through the deck, and then come down to the mass step. On this aluminum mass, we have heavy blistering of the paint going up a bit, and then we have it sitting into the step itself. But what I really like is the two battery cables that are run right by the, uh, the mass step. Worst case scenario, this is not that same mass, but um, you know, when these are left for long periods of time, this is what can happen to, to the base of the mass. Paint blisters. I've done quite a few paint repairs over the years on aluminum. And to be honest, I really not until recently started noticing how badly the corrosion could be under the paint of some of these older aluminum masks. This is just uh, maybe a 20 year old catamaran uh, paint blister. Actually, this boat was recently inspected a year before by a professional rigger. Um, and the corrosion had been building underneath this blister. And we had a stainless steel insert in this aluminum. Um, tang here and um, 
they had there really was no way to do a repair like this severe case of uh, corrosion underneath the pane of an aluminum mass um, from dissimilar metals uh, stainless steel fasteners and uh, aluminum paint's been blasted off on a mast uh, where we had paint blisters and underneath the blisters we have heavy pitting and considerable metal wastage carbon fiber mast visual inspection look for cracks in the paint look for cracks in the the mass itself the paint should be intact and in good condition not flaking off with uh, what looks to be uv damage um, from where, where the carbon fiber is visible carbon fiber visual tap testing thermal imaging ultrasound and then eventually destructive testing is the procedures we use when we're trying to determine if the mass has been damaged from lightning or maybe from uh, from stress failure so the main reason why we want to pay attention close attention to the rigging is is to try to catch these failures before they happen uh, you know people get injured um, boats have been lost offshore uh, i know plenty of people that have had dismastings or near dismastings i've lost a head stay sailing down the chesapeake bay and about 20 knots of wind. Uh, luckily, I was able to keep the mast up. But, you know, these things happen. They're scary, um, and they can be caught ahead of time for the most part. And they don't always happen when the boat's underway. A uh, storm came through one spring, 70 knot wind gust. The mizzen mast on this Whitby uh, came down. This is the culprit. One chain plate. Now this chain plate failed just above deck level or right at deck level. Um, I find that most of these failures actually happen um, either at a faster hole above deck or they happen below deck. So there's still an area through the deck that we cannot inspect. But the interesting thing is, that, is where I'm finding these failures happen and we could actually catch this. Here's a failure of a chain plate above deck, just below the faster hole. and you know, it, it looks like rotted wood. That's what crevice corrosion looks like. This is a chain plate from an older Choi Lee that had lost its mass in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, there is actually a stress crack above deck on this chain plate. Uh, the boat was not surveyed when the person purchased it. He got a good deal and he, and he bought the boat and unfortunately lost the rig. Uh, one arrow points to where the deck edge is, and the next arrow points to where the chain plate goes through the deck. And what's interesting here is the amount of corrosion underneath the deck, where the piece of trim was holding on, or was attached, um, covering the chain plate in the interior. And this is a chain plate that failed um, below deck and caused him to lose his rig. And we do not want to rule out the fasteners. Um, chain plate fasteners, you know, it's one thing, pull the chain plate off, inspect it, you know, closely inspect the fasteners. Fasteners are fairly inexpensive, just replace them. Um, we see a lot of them when they're pulled have a crevice corrosion. Fatigue failures. This is what happens when we have a problem with the geometry of the rig, when, when the rig is not perfectly or in line like it should be. We also should have all stays and shrouds should have side to side and forward and aft motion. This failed because it was attached to the masthead with only fore and aft uh, movement. And I don't think that the rig was more than 12 years old. And we can see the, the fatigue failure. On these uh, on these wires, and this mast was lost um, offshore of Florida, but with the captain by himself was actually able to uh, pull it up next to the boat, and then um, they were able to tow it in and saved it. We should all be writing a report, whether a marine survey or a rigger. Um, if you're working in the boatyard and you're just keeping an eye on this stuff. Um, 
just to spot the corrosion. Maybe that's a little bit different, but I definitely think marine surveyors and, and riggers need to be writing reports. There's some great examples in the Coast Guard um, Navic 02-16 on, on examples on how to write the reports. One thing I would stress is you should always state how you inspected it. And these are just a couple of examples. Uh, DPT is a dive penetrant testing. We went really quickly on that, so I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions. Um, and thank you for attending. All right, Dylan, thank you again. And uh, we do have some questions that came in here, so feel free to keep sending them in. Uh, if you have questions for Dylan here, we have a little extra time. Uh, let's start here. So what is the normal tension on stays? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and you can use a gauge for that. But I think if you're, um, it's really going to depend on the boat. Um, is it a lightweight sailboat, say like a J boat, or um, or is it a heavy Formosa catch or something? Um, is the mass wood or is it or is it aluminum? Uh, I tend to just do a field test, and it's when I go on to do an inspection. It's just from from years of doing this way, where I just use my fingers and pull, and I, I'm really just trying to see is everything feel like it had the same tension. Um, I think that checking the true tune of the rig and tuning the rig is a little bit more advanced than just uh, in a normal inspection and i do think if you're a rigger then you should be doing that as part of your as part of your inspection but say if you're a marine surveyor or working in the yard i think it's more of just trying to spot the overly tight stay or shroud or overly loose compared to all the other surrounding um wire rigging Right. Uh, is it true that catamaran uh, tension should be slacker compared to that of mono holes? I couldn't answer that. Um, and that's actually a really good question. Um, also, that I will, um, I'll have to look into that, ask, ask a couple designers. Um, I've really noticed no difference in tensioning on multi hulls than on, on mono hulls. All right. Uh, how would you go uh how would you go about the rig fasteners on a steel boat where you don't have separate chain plates but welded on uh exapads that may be painted over that's a great question as someone who comes from a metal boat builder family <laughs> it's probably something i should have put in there but uh really what you're looking for on painted chain plates whether it's steel or aluminum um and you it's always on steel and i have seen some aluminum chain plates that have been painted you're really looking for paint blisters. If there's a paint blister, the only thing you can do is pop that off, that blister off and get a look at it. Uh, mild steel chain plates last many, many, many years. Um, it's As long as that blister hasn't been there and it's just been festering with corrosion for years. If the paint is intact and it's nice and smooth, really all you can do is assume that it's okay underneath the paint. Um, but if it's blistered, I, I'd ask for permission to pop the blister and, and maybe even have them grind off some of that so you can get a better look at the, the steel underneath, same for aluminum. All right. Uh, one thing that I come across quite often are drooping spreaders, particularly upper spreaders on a multiple spreader rig. Uh, most, of that, most of the time, the spreaders have drooped to uh, horizontal. Have you ever seen a dismasting that could be attributed to spreader droop? And what amount of misangularity do you think must be uh, do you think is acceptable before the spreaders must be realigned if if there's a if the alignment is an issue with the spreader my opinion is you need it needs to be dealt with right away um i don't know if i've experienced a um yes i have experienced a mass breaking because of a spreader failure um, and I can think of quite a few going back into the 90s spreader failure, especially when so many of us on our boats had wood spreaders made from ash. Um, but I think it's a big deal to check the spreader attachments where they, um, at the mast, it's important to, to check them where the wire goes through the spreader or around the spreader. You can often have elongated fastener holes on these spreaders from misalignment, so you want to check that. You know, ideally having the rig down and being able to pull the spreader off. And if the boat still has wood spreaders, then that's just, um, 
they have to be pulled off. There's really no other way to inspect. You put a moisture meter on them and see if they've absorbed moisture, but you want to be able to see where the fastener goes through the, um, where the, the bracket, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, where that wood goes into that bracket and is held in place. But I definitely think any geometry of the rig that isn't correct or any misaligned spreader is has to be taken care of right away. Right. Have you seen a lot of bronze rigging fitting failures? No. And unfortunately, uh, now that I don't work on boats anymore, I don't get to play with wood boats like I used to. Um, so, but, and I don't survey very many boats with bronze fittings. The only failures I have found um, on bronze that I can think of, of is where there's been a braised bronze piece that that's failed, but I haven't seen any failure of uh, chain plates or uh, or any fittings. It's someone up in Maine or in New England might have a different experience. That's just my experience. All right. Do you prefer UV or visible dye penetrant for rod rigging? I just use I use uh, regular old um, visible dye penetrant, but you could you could use um, a UV one, but it's it's so easy to just use a magnifying glass and the dye penetrant kit. Uh, so I usually just stick with that. Right. Is there any penetrative coatings, cleaners, or products that can or should be used on stainless to prevent deterioration? I know quite a few boats I see in the Caribbean use Lana coat on the stainless steel, um, and it seems it seems to add a nice protective layer. Um, I, I that's the only thing I could think of. Um, I'm you know some people spray the stainless steel with different corrosion sprays, um, but the Lana coat seems to hold hold up well, but it has to be reapplied multiple times. And it's still, I don't know how much more life it gives you. Um, to me, I think the main key for the boat owner is just to keep the, the salt off the stainless as much as possible and then have those annual inspections done. Right. Uh, thanks for the tip uh, to IR, the cabin, uh, the the chain plates inside the cabin. What type of heat load did you use? Strictly solar. Um, so basically, put I hauled the boat out. I asked to have it north south um, bow facing north or south, and I image one side of the hull as it warms up. Ideally, from the interior if you can get access to it. If not, then just wait till the sun's moved to the other side of the boat. Image the one where the sun's been on it. And then as the sun starts to set, you can go image the other side of the hull. Uh, you could apply heat to it, but I prefer I prefer using the sun because I just think it gives me a nice even temperature to that hull structure where the heat gun is not going to be able to give that to me. And it's not going to be able to warm as much of the land that, and the stainless steel inside that I need for my inspection. All right. How about composite rigging like Dyneema or Spectra? Does it have the same life expectancy? Uh, are there are these adequately protected from UV or any other issues? Yes, and that would be actually a whole nother topic um, to do on fiber rigging. I don't have a whole lot of experience with. I'll be honest with you on that. Um, the little bit of experience I've had with it in Florida is that it's actually in, in the Caribbean. It's, it's it's holding up extremely well to the UV. Uh, there's but the key there with the fiber rig rigging is to uh, consult with the manufacturer on inspection procedures and then what they recommend is the lifespan of that rigging is what it comes down to. All right. If a mast has been struck by lightning, how do you know if it needs to be replaced? I get a lot of these um, and most of the time with aluminum masts, I, the only time I think I've seen two, three, three masks that have had been replaced, one from Lightning, and that's because there were some poor welds. Um, that's a long story, but there was just no feasible way to safely repair this mask. Uh, the other two haven't been lightning strikes, but they've been electrical surges from hitting power lines, and they just melted. It looked like someone went around with a TIG weld gun and just started zapping the mast. And fasteners were melted together, and it, it was a big disaster. But for most lightning strikes, I would say a close inspection, take a look at the stainless steel fittings for any bluing, any blackening, 
you might have some charred paint at the masthead. Grind that off, take a look at the aluminum, and the mast is probably okay. Carbon fiber masts are a little bit different. Um, core, I've seen it major issues with cord um, carbon fiber extrusions after lightning. Most um, solid laminate masts, I experienced some damage to the resin, but nothing that hasn't been repairable. But that's where if you find something like that, you're doing an inspection, I never make the decision on if it can be repaired. That's a naval architect, that's a marine engineer with the experience um, in those materials to help make that decision on if it's repairable or not. Can you use a thermography to assess the standing rigging wire? No, I don't see any way possible that you'd be able to do that. Um, really the only NDT that you can use, and it's it still doesn't be um, a good magnifying glass, is you could ultrasound a swedge fitting. It's a little difficult to do, and you need a small enough transducer. Um, I have used it on chain plates that have been pulled out of the boat or even still on the boat to kind of represent to a boat owner that the chain plate needs to be pulled. I see a rust stain. I will use the ultrasound on the side of the chain plate and run it up and down on a, you run it on just uh, getting the, the the measurement of the metal, but you can also put on a B scan uh, or A scan so you can watch the, the waveform show that to the boat owner and show them how the thickness of the chain plate changes as you, as you move it. Then you pull the chain plate off and then most of the time what you're going to see is what I represent in my photos of the metal wastage and cracking behind. All right. Do you recommend slackening off the rig like the backstay when not sailing or tightening it until the rig is firm to prevent the rig wiggling and jiggling in the wind and waves thus causing wear at the joints? My personal experience on sailing is, um, you know, I, 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 once that rig's tuned, I, I don't touch it. Now, the, the exception would be a hydraulic backstay. Um, and yes, you don't, you know, I've sailed Baltics and Swans, uh, or been on Swans and sailed Baltic offshore. And you know, when you they have the hydraulic backstay and you don't, you don't want to create stress to that rig. So you want proper tension on that. And of course, the tension's adjusted as you sail. But as far as a mechanical turnbuckle, um, I put a bend in the mass that I want or an owner wants um, and then leave it at that and, and don't touch it. Um, I know some rigs have detachable baby stays that can be connected when beating the windward to keep the mass from pumping. Um, so that's a good idea. But I don't like overly slack rigs, especially on boats that are offshore beating the windward constantly, constantly moving, causing stress. Right. Uh, should rigging and chain plates be connected to a bonding and ground system? I will refer you to the ABYC uh, standards. Um, but yes, I think that there needs to be proper lightning protection to uh, from from the and, and there's some challenges with that. Um, that could be like a whole nother topic there also. But I do believe that there needs to be impact lightning protection. Um, and it has to be the right gauge wire. It needs to be run as straight as possible, which it can be very difficult on most sailboats. And the connections shouldn't have any corrosion to them. And in my experience, I think that this really helps give the lightning a path, it minimizes damage. Now you might have to replace some of the standing rigging and do some paint work on the mast and replace all your light electronics. But I think it, it's safe for the, for the boat on a whole to give it a path to go out the keel. And if you're looking for those standards, you have uh, TE4 is our lightning protection standard and E2 is our cathodic protection standard. So between the two of those, that'll cover your lightning protection and uh, bonding concerns. Uh, what metal fittings work best with aluminum? What we always do with our aluminum boats and, and rigs um, is stainless steel and, and use TEF gel and, and good bedding. Um, and then plan on rebedding that stuff in seven or 10 years. I know a lot of these masks, they bed the hardware on it and it's never removed for 20 some years. And then we see issues. Um, I would like to see, um, I would love to see us to be able to 
the move to more titanium um, fasteners and, and chain plates. And, and hopefully we're, we're going to move to that at one day. Um, and there are sources to purchase this, but that still can be incredibly expensive for some some pieces. I find it um, the fasteners are more expensive sometimes than the chain plates that you have fabricated. So those costs need to come down before we see that more acceptable. But I think it's okay to continue using stainless steel fasteners as long as you just offer proper isolation um, of that faster and the aluminum mass it's going into. All right, uh, many sources of corrosion information, especially inspected uh, inspection and replacement timelines are geared toward saltwater environments. Are there good places to find information about freshwater environments? Not that I know of, but, but and, I should, and, and shame on me for kind of assuming we're all living on the coast watching this presentation. But freshwater is a big deal, um, not as far as corrosion or anything else, but the complacency that, well, the boat's been in fresh water, I'm not gonna have any corrosion. Well, that might, be, that might be the case, but what you could still have with fresh water is the stress cracking. And that rig could be beautiful, 10 years old, 15 years old. Um, that failure of the swedge fitting where the wire broke, that's in my presentation, that would have happened on the Great Lakes or it would have happened off the coast of Florida. That was a fatigue failure, had nothing to do with corrosion. So the best thing for you to do if you're inspecting this in, in fresh water is just maybe start dye penetrant testing everything to make sure you catch the cracks. If not, just pay extra special attention with that magnifying glass because it's so easy to miss a stress crack on a nice piece of stainless steel that shows no corrosion. And in the um, in the Coast Guard circular, there is a resource list of resources in the back of that um, that you all might want to look at. There's a lot of different um, resources for for articles and um, books. Some of them are no longer published, but you might be able to still find it used bookstores or Amazon. But I highly recommend looking into that for some information and research. And I'll pull that link, Dylan, and uh, when we send the follow-up email for this, as well as in the YouTube description, uh, we will put the link for that, because um, I did have it pulled oh, up, okay. so anybody yeah. will we'll get it out to you. Um, would you recommend That's bare perfect. wire or covered lifeline? Bare. I will, um, I will, I started using uncoated lifelines, I think, in the late 90s on boats I managed, and I'll never use a coated lifeline again, um, and it's mainly because of the, the crevice corrosion that develops and the salt is held there at that swedge fitting right where that coated um, vinyl is and it just it ends up getting in there and that's what causes those, those not failures but the corrosion you can see on one of my slides. So I know some owners are not going to want that they're going to want coated but if they do go with coated I put seven years as the time limit on those um, and even after four or five years if the boats in the southeast or caribbean i tend to inspect them very carefully and then at seven years it's like okay they're not that expensive i'm going to pull them off and we're going to replace them all right and we have time for one last question for you here um, i often see cracks in the paint on an aluminum mast where the tang fittings have large plates welded to them and these in turn are riveted to a chain plate uh sorry rivet, riveted or chain welded to the mast the cracks are in the edges of the plates where in contact uh, with the mast, and I've always believed that they're inconsequential. What's your opinion? Recently, I inspected a mast um, is off of a Maxi, um, a, a 90s era Maxi racer. Um, a lot of paint blistering, a lot of bolted on plates like you described. And it, it was a big eye opener for me, even after being around masks as long as I have, I mean, going all the way back to you know, being a kid. Um, it was an eye opener when we had a lot of paint blisters, we had some corrosion, we pulled a couple fasteners, we were getting a little concerned and we pulled off these doubler plates and all these riveted plates and plates that were not welded completely around. And there was major metal wastage underneath these plates and the mass was completely done. Um, there was no way to repair it. There was, um, so that concerns me. Um, you know, maybe a year or two ago, I just said, just keep an eye on the paint blisters and I keep it, you know, make sure that they're painted and no water's getting in there. But now after seeing this mass, 
I really feel that there's a certain point that all that stuff has to come off. Um, and there's a good chance there's gonna be metal wastage under there. I tried to do an ultrasound before we had to take that step of removing them, but there's too much, there was too much corrosion between the top plate and the mass extrusion for me to get a good reading. All right, so with that, I'll uh, put myself back on screen here. And once again, Dylan, thank you very much for, for the time this afternoon. Um, he has a contact info up there. Check out his website, email him if you have anything for him. Um, and uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you will see the link pop up on the screen. Uh, somewhere around my head, probably. Uh, Matt will probably make a joke of it. Uh, once again, our next uh, webinar is going to be July 23rd on propane systems. So mark your calendars for that. We will send out an invite ahead of time. And um, anything else you need, just let us know. Hopefully everyone's getting back to business good. And uh, once again, Dylan, thank you very much. And uh, everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. You're very welcome, David. I appreciate uh, you doing all this for us. And uh, everyone, take care and be safe. Thanks, Dylan.